All right. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Judy Simcox. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry, um, and it is my great pleasure to host uh, this talk by a Dr. <clears throat> Maggie Werner Washington. <clears throat> Um, Maggie is a nationally recognized expert in both yeast metabolism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, she is homegrown, uh, so she received her PhD in the uh, Department of Botany here at UW-Madison, and she did her postdoctoral work with uh, Betty Craig. She went on to join the faculty at the University of New Mexico, um, and she has received too many awards to even uh, mentioned, but a few of them are the NSF's Director's Special Service Award, the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science and Mathematics and Engineering Mentoring, and the AAAS uh, Mentor Award for Lifetime Achievement, as well as the Harvard Foundation Scientist of the Year. Um, she's been a leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and she's most proud of mentoring more than 500 students. Uh, who have achieved advanced degrees, um, including well over 100 PhDs and uh, 50 MDs. Um, she's also recently been working to increase uh, uh, the uh, STEM industry in New Mexico by starting STEM Boomerang. Um, a lot of this work she's not going to talk about, but she is going to talk about uh, uh, a bit about her journey and her work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm so proud to host her as a friend and colleague. Maggie, you can take it away. All right, thank you, Judy. I am so happy to be talking to you all, but, uh, and I'll probably like lapse back into my Wisconsin accent, but um, I'm so sorry I'm not there. It has been, I have had a wonderful time talking with uh, a lot of different people, friends, new friends and, uh, and, and colleagues. Um, at the university, and it's uh, it's you know it's always great to get back to Wisconsin. <clears throat> and I know you had homecoming. I'm sure you guys were all out on the field. I think there was a football game, and <laughs> I just remember the fire engine going by, going da 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 da. -da. Anyway, I'll get going. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk about what thermodynamics taught me about diversity and inclusion, and. Uh, <clears throat> The talk has, so let's see if I have figure out how to get to the next slide. Good. So the talk has four parts to it. And the first part is going to be some history of mine. And then I want to talk about what we call hard problems. Some people call them wicked problems. And the importance of imagination. And then my use of thermodynamics to try to understand a little bit about the hard problem of diversity and inclusion. And then I want to talk about deconvoluting the two faces of bias. We often talk about implicit bias, but there are actually different parts to, to the kinds of bias that we experience. Uh, Outgroup out -group discrimination and in-group favoritism are the two major ones I'll talk about. <clears throat> and finally, I want to get to discussing inclusion. So inclusion is more of a relationship. And I want to talk about turning diversity, which is just people of all different colors kind of standing there together, um, into what we might look at as we, so that when we say we, we mean everybody in the room. Let's see, how do I do this? Okay, good. So my family, and I don't think many people knew this at Wisconsin when I was there, because <clears throat> there weren't many other Hispanics when I was there, but my mom came up from Mexico with her family, and this is my mom on the, you know, I don't have the pointer set up. I don't know if you can see it, but my mom's on the left. My grandmother's in the middle and those are my mom's siblings all around her. It was 1914, it was a Mexican revolution. My grandfather worked in the mines. Wilson said he wouldn't protect the nationals. And so they, he was a, a US citizen. They started killing people and kidnapping kids. And the British sent a train and took uh, my, my grandparents and their family uh, up to uh, Veracruz and from there they went to uh, New Orleans. When they got to New Orleans, my grandmother put her arms around the kids and she said, no, losing everything was the best thing that ever happened to us. She said, now we know what's really important. It's what can't be taken away. And that's our family, our education and our faith. Thank God for nothing. And thank God for nothing was really a motto in my family for a long time. And I grew up in Iowa. It's a Really long story, I'm gonna to try to keep it short. Um, I went to Stanford after 12 years in Catholic schools because I saw a magazine that called Stanford the farm. And being from Iowa, of course, I knew farms. 
And my grandparents' cook had once been Leland Stanford's cook. Uh, my grandparents' cook in Mexico had once worked for Leland Stanford. So I thought we had family connections. And, and this is a problem I have sometimes, assuming I have a stronger relationship than I do with something. In any event, Stanford was an enormous shock. I didn't realize that I had not, I guess, never seen really wealthy people. And um, so that was a big shock. And um, the other thing is that even though I knew I was Mexican, um, I don't look Mexican. I grew up with Chicano foster brothers. I didn't realize I was not identifiable. And so I had a lot of challenges at Stanford. And when I finished, uh, and I had, I had a scholarship, so I stayed, that, that kept me in school. Uh, but anyway, so when I finished, I went immediately to Mexico. And when I hit Mexico, I was really home. I, people, I understood how people made their decisions. Um, you know, people were so wonderful to me and I understood their priorities and I just fit completely into that culture. It was a great feeling. And it's also where I became a scientist. So I was in Oaxaca, which is in the southern part of Mexico. It was the first time I'd really been around intact indigenous tribes. And the women in Tehuantepec wore purple uh, weepils, the blouses. And I, I, the, I thought, well, that's strange because purple's the royal color. And it turns out that the men in their village had learned that they could take cotton fibers down to the ocean and agitate mollusks. And they gave off purple dye and the salt water acted as a mordant. And for some reason that just opened my mind to all the things that were around me that the indigenous groups were using to heal and to clothe and to feed themselves. And I got very interested in the co-evolution of plants and humans. And um, I met with you know, every curandera and brujo and anybody I could. And I made it by land. I was hitchhiking all the way down to Colombia and Ecuador and actually to Venezuela at one point. These are some people that I lived with in my little village in, in Colombia. And um, it was all this time I thought, you know, I'm a sponge of, you know, indigenous knowledge. And I really, what I need to do is get in back to Western science. It didn't happen immediately. I went to Alaska with my first husband. And uh, uh, that's another long story. We ran out of supplies and had to live on what we could hunt and gather. But while I was out hunting one day, I had this blinding flash that if it weren't for the evolution of photosynthesis that nothing that we knew other than sludge on rocks would exist. So I was bound sort of in my soul to being a botanist and what happened. I went from um, there basically to Hawaii where I got my master's degree and uh, it was a wonderful place and there were, it was a trop ag school. So there were kids from Central America who came and so I could teach biochemistry in Spanish. That was very fun. And um, I went from there to Madison. And I think what people in Madison definitely didn't know was that by the time I got to Madison, I, um, I had uh, been friends with or lived with or on bowling teams with, um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, my, my computer's giving, I hate these messages you get up here. Hang on just a minute. I can't figure out how to get to it. Okay, here we go. All right friends are on bowling teams with people from, let me go back here. No, it won't go back, this will go, this will go back. People from at least 25 different indigenous groups from New Zealand to uh, Minnesota, from Colombia and Venezuela and Ecuador um, up to Alaska. And so, uh, you know, that had been my experience. And when I got to Madison, it was just so different, you know, <laughs> and, um, and really, uh, I didn't know any other Hispanics. I didn't know any other Mexican Americans who were interested in science. And um, as I told people, many people that when they had a Hispanic meeting at, in Madison, it would be me and the janitors. <laughs> and they go, what are you doing here? It was, it was very fun. So when I interviewed um, in New Mexico for job, oh, I worked, I did my PhD with um, uh, Ken Keekster in botany, and then with Betty Craig in uh, uh, for my postdoc. And when I got to New Mexico to interview, uh, I fell in love with the students. I mean, I just, I, they were just beautiful to me. And I heard Spanish and there were lots of uh, Native Americans. And, you know, it just felt so wonderful to me that I realized that that was where I was going to have to be. 
And, and so the other things to remember in sort of my, this career is that music and family has always been very important to me. I've always, I've been, played a lot of music in my life. I was a scientist, not because I understood academia or anything like that. I was just, you know, passionately engaged with learning and with science because of my experiences. And that in, ac in terms of faculty and academia, um, I always lived in an intersecting, but really a non, not identical world. So my priorities were quite different. All right, enough of me. I wanna to talk today about hard problems. I love hard problems. They're, they're fascinating to solve. And, and hard problems are like climate change, education, war, uh, targeted hate groups, polarization, diversity and inclusion. You know, these things that we just like, they seem like you can't solve them, right? And my definition of hard problems is that they are chronic, they're complex, they usually involve people. Um, the proposed solutions that people have for them are usually too obvious, they're knee jerk and they don't work, right? So with education, it was fire the teachers, the kids are lazy, the parents aren't doing their jobs. Um, they're often stabilized by non-obvious forces. So you want to go right at the, at the face of this thing, but that's not gonna work because really it's something underneath, usually with something with human nature and sometimes with evolution that has, that has stabilized it. And once you figure out what's stabilizing it, you can often imagine how to disrupt it. It might not be a hard thing to do, but it's not easy because so many people are convinced that it can't be solved. And communication of real solutions can be very, very difficult. So oftentimes when I have a hard problem, I try to think of it in different ways. And so this one I'm talking about today is going to be using um, thermodynamics and then and a bit of evolution. So I have to thank Wayne Becker and Tom Record for teaching um, Gibbs Free Energy correctly to me twice. It was just a thrill. Um, what happens is that, um, uh, so let's go, that's the equation. Okay, so Delta G, this is Josiah Gibbs down here at the bottom and, and he's somebody I really hope to meet if after we die, there's any chance of that. Um, but anyway, so Gibbs Free Energy is the amount of energy available from a reaction. And the equation that I love which I often tell my students is the guardian angel of the cell is minus RT, the natural log of the equilibrium constant plus RT, the natural log of the concentration of products over reactants. So if you, uh, so chemists and physicists really like to work with constants. They have to, right? So you have to compare apples and apples. So what they do is they make products equal reactants when they're trying to figure out what the delta G zero prime is. So it's constant, uh, pressure, which is the R, constant temperature, which is in degrees Kelvin, right? That's no problem for biologists for the most part. But they also make products equal reactants. The natural log of one is zero. So this whole second term um, is gone then with a delta G zero prime. But for biologists, the concentration of products of reactants is, is where the action is. Because if you have, for example, very little product and a lot of reactants, then that is a fraction, right? And the log of a fraction is a negative number. So the delta G actually increases in a negative fashion so that you get more energy out of a reaction. So you can make reactions go one way or the other way simply by, by changing the amount of product of a reactant and eukaryotic cells can do this. So it's really unbelievably amazing and it allows things to happen inside cells that we really could never imagine. And it's important to know that life isn't based on constants, but it's weak interactions and it's, it's flexibility, the reversibility of reactions. And um, so it's, um, you know, all things are possible because of this, this equation explains why all things are possible. The second thing I need to ask you to do as we're thinking about all this is to um, remember your imagination. So Albert Einstein probably should have gotten the Nobel Prize for helping us remember um, that we need to be creative and how to, how to achieve that. Uh, he said imagination is more important than knowledge. And in fact, he figured out relativity by imagining himself riding on a particle of light. I mean, you have to know physics, but you have to have imagination, right? 
So in my classes, once I figured out that one of the problems we were having with education was that the students weren't using their imagination, I would start my classes by having us all close our eyes and imagine walking from our classroom in over to some restaurant near campus, or you could walk to Babcock Hall or something like that. And, and we would imagine, okay, get up, you go to the door. How do you know you're at the door? What are you feeling in the hallway? What, your, what are your feet walking on? What do you hear? What do you smell? And really get them to think of all their senses, not their eyes, but their, you know, what, you know, smelling, feeling and everything. We get to the restaurant and I would say, you know what? You didn't memorize that walk. You learned it in your bones. And, and then what we would try to do is say, okay, imagine your whole body's a peptide. And imagine, so you have all these R groups coming out from your arm and imagine you have a serine on your arm. And how does that feel having that polar group there? And how, what happens if it gets phosphorylated? How does that feel? So that they can imagine themselves being the same size as the molecules that they're trying to study. And when you have a phosphate on your arm, if you've ever gotten electric shock, you'll know it's, it's like prickly, you know? And so it's like everything wants to move around to avoid that. And, and then we would like become 10 nanometers and go inside cells and ask questions. But it's really important. Imagination is a muscle. And the other thing to remember is that the laws of physics scale. So that's one of the ways that we could really solve some hard problems in biology was knowing that atoms, molecules, cars, and stars all have to pay attention to the laws of physics so that we, if we had a problem that we couldn't imagine how to solve at the molecular level, we could go up and say, well, now how do grocery stores do it? How do, how, you know, and then use that as a way to go back and kind of rethink maybe what happened inside the cell. So imagination and reframing are really superpowers. <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk about beans today. And the reason I'm talking about beans is that, um, uh, well, let me see, I think I can, let's see if I can get my pointer to work. And uh, let's see it. Okay, I don't see how to do it. All right, um, I'm gonna talk about beans because we're not emotional about beans. <clears throat> and so it's easy to talk about diversity and human stuff, we just talk about these other things. So here's a pile of mixed beans up at the top. And you can have uh, three potential outcomes from this pile of mixed beans. You could get a pile of beans assorted by type, which is an A. You could get the mixed beans back, which you see in B. And you could get a pile of white beans that you would see in C. And this is where I first started thinking about thermodynamics. But let me just say, what happens is that you are, it seems unlikely to get A and C out of a pile of mixed beans, right? So entropy plays a part there. It doesn't seem reasonable that you would get order out of disorder. It doesn't happen in the universe. But I thought about it. And you know, in, in, in New Mexico, I see A all the time. I mean, my kids, when they were going to school in elementary school, they were just a big mix of kids and lots of different kinds of friends. When they hit middle school and started walking from classroom to classroom, they all started pulling out by identity groups. And there's a book about, you know, why do all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria? But you see this in neighborhoods. Now, sometimes it's because of redlining. So this can be imposed by laws and, and other things. But you know, people want to be with people who are like them because it's easier. Uh, Daniel Kahneman calls it cognitive ease that makes that uh, this, uh, desirable. And, and it's important actually for the, for the stabilization, growth and development of culture and languages and traditions that people who are alike get this chance to be together. And I think sometimes feel guilty about that happening. But I think we have to say that that's just sort of a natural thing that happens in human populations and um, not really try to feel too bad about that. So, so even though these, I have these two X's to mean that entropy doesn't favor A and C. And C, we see all the time. We see it in the Forbes 500 boards. Uh, we see it in the uh, country clubs, this 
STEM faculty, administrations, government, we see it all over the place, medicine for sure. And, and B, uh, you know, we don't see that often. And it made me, um, it made me start thinking. I mean, A made me start thinking, especially because there's this whole thing about implicit bias. And, and I thought, you know, there's two parts to this. And, and I think I can begin to look at, at it and maybe thermodynamics can help me. So what, what the deal is that we haven't spent enough time, if, if, if human populations, uh, you know, if human populations uh, tend to go to A, uh, what we need to figure out since we believe in our hearts and there's like evidence for data for uh, diverse effective teams being much more innovative and successful coming up with a variety of solutions that hadn't been thought of before. If we believe that diversity in our daily lives and our workforces is really important, and, and if we tend to get to A, we have to think more about what it takes to get from A to B. And we have to think more about what it takes to get from B to C. So the challenge then is to really think of these things as, as reactions and try to figure out how to increase reversibility, um, how, to, how to look at the flow across A, B, and C as sort of like, I don't know, enzyme transition states or something like that. Right, and, and if you think about the propensity to get A and C, which we see all the time, um, I would say if you're gonna think about equilibrium constants, that's got a huge equilibrium constant. So it makes it even difficult if you don't have B to imagine that you would get B, right? So if that's, we've got to uh, how it be more stable, more attractive as a, as a solution. Um, so, so first of all, we're gonna figure out what forces stabilize A and C? And then we wanna talk about what would make B more stable, sort of self-assemble, for example, so that this would be a, com a compelling force for diversity. So the things that stabilize A and C, there's two parts to it and it's evolutionarily, uh, you know, a big deal. And it's, it's even seen, you see it in animal herds and things, but in humans, um, in groups can form extremely quickly. Uh, they sometimes come from identity groups sometimes, and, and, you know, there can be deep reasons for an in-group forming, or it can be a very superficial reason for an in-group, but they generally provide comfort and stability to the people that um, are in the in-group. And, uh, the rules in an in-group transfer invisibly. You know, that's the challenge is that um, you often just have agreed upon uh, rules or, or, you know, that within the, within the group and, and you may not be able to see it from outside. And, and the in-group itself can have power and that's where it gets to be a challenge for everyone to some extent. So out-groups, you know, you're in an out-group. Uh, if you're asking, what are the rules? Who has the power? Why can't they see me? Why don't people hear what I say? And out groups can easily identify in groups. And, and it's really, uh, Harvard Business Review just had an article about why, why having out group people in your group is really important because they're the ones who aren't swayed by the in group. They know where the in group uh, ends and they know uh, they can speak to the in group even if they're not in the in group. Okay, so, so the stabilizing forces then of A and C, uh, I think the easiest ways to think about it are outgroup out -group discrimination. So the red beans don't want to be with the white beans, right? So they just don't, they wanna keep that separate. Or, or in-group favoritism, which is I really want to be with this, with this group that I identify with, you know? And, and then we have to accept the possibility that which I, in terms of A and C, I think is unlikely, but that maybe there's just poor mixing, you know? So maybe there, maybe there are some neutral groups in there, but they just, we just haven't mixed it up enough. And um, let's see. So, so uh, in-group favoritism uh, causes us to overestimate the abilities and values of our immediate group 
and at, at the expense of people we don't know. But we're gonna talk first about out-group discrimination and then a little bit more about in-group favoritism. So the out-group discrimination example that I like talk, to talk about is uh, Jackie Robinson and Branch Rickey. So in 1945 or before, all baseball teams were white the, in the National League and the American League. There was a Negro League. But if you looked around and you were looking for a second base player, for example, a shortstop or something, you know, and you looked all over the country for the very best player, you would always find a white player for your team. And Branch Rickey decided that it was time to really diversify baseball. And so he chose Jackie Robinson because he had been on, on sports teams at UCLA and he'd been in the military. So he knew he could handle living in a, in, a, in a diverse environment. And plus he was a good baseball player. So I have 42, that's the movie about it. And it stars Chadwick, the late Chadwick Boseman. And I would suggest that you see it one, because. Chadwick Boseman's amazing. And two, because what you see in the movie is that all of Branch Rickey's associates were against bringing Jackie Robinson into the team. And, and, and they just were, they were bound and determined to keep him in the out group. It was not gonna happen. But as they saw Jackie have to go through amazingly difficult, unfair discrimination and racist attacks, you know, basically what you could see is like, Bing, this one out group opens up and all of a sudden Jackie's part of their in group. Bing, 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 until Pee Wee Reese finally says, you know, you're a good man, uh, Jackie Robinson. And so that he won over his, the Yankees team. And the one scene I love is the last time Jackie gets cleated at first base and he goes into the locker room there. And he goes, Mr. Ricky, why did you bring me into, uh, why'd you bring me into the team? And Branch says, well, you know, I was going to make money and all this stuff. And, and he goes, no, no, I don't, I don't think that's true. <laughs> what, why did you bring me onto the team? And Branch goes, because you made me love baseball again. Okay. So this ended up, this association between these two men ended up being a positive for the whole team and for both of them. And it also changed baseball. So the red group are the are whites in baseball, green is blacks in baseball, blue or purple, whatever that color is, are Hispanics or Latinos, and, and the top or color, top color, orange or something is um, Asians. And, and what you can see here is that, in fact, this is a map from the Pew Research Center of diversity, of the timeline of diversity in the United States. And this is about 2020. What you can see is that this is, follows that pretty well um, in terms of diversification of baseball. There's a, a sort of flattening here of African-Americans in baseball, but um, people are working on trying to figure out what, what's happening here. But in any event, Jackie Robbins over here made a huge difference. And, and you know, it wasn't just in baseball. I mean, they actually made a big difference in all sorts of sports, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so from this thing, in terms of racism, uh, and the ways that I would see to reduce outgroup discrimination, which you know can be race, racism, but it can also be you know, anti-Semitism, it can be all sorts of things, um, is really forming partnerships, alliances, and being sponsors. Uh, creating a community, you know, uh, and, I, and I see that the need for this, and it's amazing that social media doesn't seem to be doing that within some groups, uh, but it's important. Legislation is important. Sometimes it has mixed effects, but our civil rights laws and the voting rights laws were very important um, for reducing the amount of outgroup discrimination in our country. Communication and relationship is really important. People have to say when they're experiencing that, and we have to communicate back, you know, that that is not okay, and that our relationship isn't going to have that, and our relationship isn't, doesn't support that kind of thing. And if I tell my students, if you run into that and it's repeated it over and over, then you should just go bring your team, you know, bring your group, bring your, 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 
the people that you work with that are really understand this thing to deal with it. And, and for those of you who aren't experiencing this, you know, be the team, you know, be the group that can help deal with this. But I would say overt racism and all the other isms, um, they get our attention because they cause a great deal of pain. And, um, and so it's, uh, you know, I think we put a lot of attention onto this part of discrimination. And when you talk about even implicit bias or unconscious bias, I mean, generally people are thinking about bias against. And, and that's uh, when I was first talking about this stuff, I called Tony Greenwald, who's the person at Harvard who invented this. He's at Washington now. And um, I said, you know, it bothers me that you can't, you don't know if you're biased for or against. And um, I don't think he realized uh, what a significant difference this is. So now I wanna talk about bias four. Okay, so this is in-group favoritism. And, and the first thing I wanna talk about, so in, as I said, in-groups form very quickly. Sometimes you can't tell if you're in an in-group. I mean, you really can't. And, and you make mistakes because you're in the in-group and don't realize that other people are feeling the edges of your in-group. This is a graph um, based on work done by Aaron Clausett and his colleagues at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And Aaron is a, just an amazing computer scientist and, and he also thinks about social situations to try to understand them. And in this particular case, if a person gets a PhD at one school and takes a job at a school that's less prestigious, then the lines connecting the two, the two schools are blue. And if a person gets their PhD at a lower prestige, prestige school and takes a job at a higher prestige school, the lines connecting them are red. So I'm just, you know, take a minute to look at that and realize that most of the lines there are blue, okay? And this is for computer science faculty. He did it for faculty in history and business also. And the question he was asking is, does prestige equal merit? And this is about 5,000 people in computer science between 2011 and 2012. And, and what he found was that for the top 10 schools, and I have that red arrow at Wisconsin, you're number 12, but the top, the top 10 schools, those people who graduate from there have 1.6 to three times, uh, produce 1.6 to three times more faculty than the second 10, okay? And they produce 2.3 to six times more faculty than the next 10. And the next 10 includes Michigan and Johns Hopkins and you know some, some very good schools. So he wanted to know if the people from the first 10 institutions were that many times better faculty, more productive than the other ones. And he found out that they weren't. So it suggested that this pattern of, of hiring people from very high level institutions um, is status favoritism. The other thing he noticed was interestingly enough, the top, 25%, 205 schools in this analysis, I think. And, and, and the top 25% um, of schools produce about 85% of all computer sciences faculty. So that the structure of the network really has strong implications for how ideas um, are, are spread in the academy, in academia. And these things in my mind, present great challenges to ever diversifying the faculty because the labs at these institutions are not generally not diverse and they're very large. In fact, the, the size of the bar, say by MIT, for example, you can see that MIT is producing huge numbers of faculty and Caltech is up there. It's a very wonderful small school. It, it's, it produces, it's a prestigious school, but it doesn't produce the huge numbers of faculty that some of the other ones do. So when you think about this, uh, you know, I, it made me think deeply, more deeply about faculty hiring, right? So 
So you want somebody from one of these big schools. That's wonderful. From one of these prestigious schools. There's an attraction, right? There's a prestige bias from that. Okay, so that's great. Well, then I think about my faculty hiring committees. What did we look at next? We looked at publications. Well, isn't that interesting that it's easier to get your paper into a high impact journal if you're at one of these prestigious universities than if you're say at the University of New Mexico. And so, wow, so they've got, um, they're at a prestigious school, uh, their publications are in very high impact journals. Um, uh, their letters of recommendation, oh, look, they're from famous people, people we know, we trust those people, right? Again, prestige bias. And then we're interested in the areas of research that they have. And oh, it's really a hot area because of the way the, it, you know, it can be associated with the way the ideas are flowing into the academy. So what I suggest is that uh, in, and I don't, I haven't been on a hiring committee in Wisconsin, but the ones that I have seen that there are often, uh, we have confounding factors in how we quantify and evaluate applicants. And so I would just say that um, prestige bias in group favoritism is something uh, I hope the faculty all think about around the country. I'm hoping to write an article about this because I think it's, it's pretty uh, important for changing how we evaluate uh, applicants. But this kind of a thing is also seen in sports. In fact, a lot of the teams or the players are really uh, making a lot of complaints about this. So here's the WNBA. Blue are players, red are managers, NBA players, managers, Major League Baseball, NFL managers, players. And, and the, the um, incorporation of black managers into many of these uh, positions has been, uh, it's very, uh, you can lose three or four in a season and, and it just, you know, but it's been fairly flat over a long time. And, and the question is why don't they hire people who actually know how to play the game and and there's no good answer. And so this is something that um, sports teams are spending a lot of time talking about. But it's also true in the NCAA. I mean, if you look at the people who are playing the games versus who are the coaches and managers, um, and for example, the athletic directors of Division I sports, I think are 353 athletic directors in the NCAA and 85% are men. 78% are white and 20% and are people of color. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's an interesting thing. And, uh, you know, I'm not in that group, so I don't know what all the reasons are for having such a relatively low uh, representation in the upper levels. The, the owners are practically all white. There's one owner of a, an NBA team, that's Michael Jordan. And then I decided, well, maybe I'll look at um, schools, you know, maybe universities. Let's see what's happening here. So I look at the, this across the country, and there's 45% diversity among undergraduates. We lose 13% going to graduate school, we lose another 9% looking at faculty. And this is all faculty. So STEM faculty are uh, 10%. Uh, there, there's 10% that are seen as a Black. Latinx or other people of color. And 13% of the provosts and presidents are, are, um, are uh, people of color. So I thought, well, you know, maybe that's just a blip in time since that was, I think, 2020 numbers, and maybe it's maybe it's changing and I'm not catching it. So I went to um, this, uh, so I have this graph here. I'm, I had to move to my office because my internet was not stable. So I'm like in a mess here. It's not, actually not my office, it's somebody else's office. And uh, so anyway, this is higher education administrators and it's from the uh, Zipia company. Um, and what they, and, and these have about 50, 60% women. So I think it's a very deep dive into upper administrations. But what you can see is that it's about 70% um, white and it's decreasing very, very slowly. So I thought, well, let me ask her, let me look into this a little bit more and see what I could find out. So here's again, the, the Pew uh, uh, graph about the diversification of the country. So the time to reach uh, the diversity that we have now, which is 40% 
people of color and 60% white, okay? For all faculty, it's going to take 25 years. It's gonna be much longer for STEM faculty, probably could be 50 years or more. For Fortune 500 boards, they're diversifying at 0.05% per year, 0.5%, I hope I said. Um, that'll take 44 years. So to 2065, they will get to today's level of diversity. So it'll be about 20% behind here. University administrations, it's going to take 66 years. University presidents, uh, this data is very sparse and it's very hard to find to find this data. So, you know, when I'm done with this talk, then I'm gonna be really trying to dig uh, further into the data, but I, I could find four numbers for this. And so the time to get to today's diversity of university presidents will be 105 years or never. <clears throat> and the, and so it's 2125 maybe, <laughs> but the data is very, very sparse. And professional sports managers and owners, it's completely questionable because it's been absolutely flat since 1990. And just to remind you, the Civil War was 156 years ago. So I think, you know, uh, this is interesting. And I can't say I know a ton of university presidents. I don't know the boards of regents or your chancellors or whoever, whoever picks the, re the presidents. But I do know that, remember, that's where we're getting all this information about diversity. I just get a message from UNM president today about it. And we're getting all these this data on us about you know faculty diversity, student diversity, all that kind of stuff. And all I would say is that I think it's time for us to tell the administrations, look in the mirror, look in the mirror. Everybody's got to work on this if we're going to get anywhere. And, and again, it's because one, we confound factors in, in our evaluation of applications. And um, two, I think we don't really believe or know how to get to the point where we can count on diverse teams to be, to be as innovative as possible, okay? So in-group favoritism can be difficult to identify. Um, you, you, you can find it by, first of all, finding non-random distributions, right? Just like that A beans, like you see here. And, and then you say, well, why? Why is it like that? And it could be, you know, it could be laws, it could be, redlining, it could be a number of things, but it also could be in-group favoritism, where it's not that necessarily they hate another group, it's just that they love being together so much that um, they, they don't care about another group. And I've, I've run into this myself, you know, where people just think, um, you know, uh, diversity isn't anything I ever have to think about. Why are you talking to me about it, right? And uh, and so they, it's, it, you know, it's something that we can work on. I, I, I like to imagine that the in-group doesn't blank what diversity brings to the table. So they don't know, they don't think about, they don't care. They don't know how to start uh, having it happen. I mean, there's a lot of things, you know, I think we need to know, get to know the in-groups a lot more to actually figure out um, how to uh, be, and to start this process of opening up these groups a little bit. And I think we need to understand the training and the hiring path and the priorities at this level. Because um, I had a, a thing happen at, uh, at NIH, I was on this advisory council and uh, there was myself and a black uh, man from AAAMC and they were so excited about the diversity uh, there were 22 of us, mostly captains of industry and heads of departments and universities and stuff. And um, so they wanted me to talk about diversity. And uh, I started and a person stopped me and said, you know, I don't know why you're talking to me about this because it's nothing I really have to do. And we just stopped talking. And I spent three years going to lunch with these guys. And I figured out a way to actually speak to them in a way, in a, in, in a manner that, that got to them. But you have to really get close and understand uh, what they're thinking about and how they're thinking. So you have to consider, uh, I would just say it, fine, with respect to in-group uh, bias, consider what you're quantifying. Make sure that you don't have confounding factors. 
It's extremely easy to confound factors. And so that, you know, it's additive. And so by the time you're done, this looks perfect. Because as, as Aaron Clausett suggests in his papers, you may get some really radically new and interesting ideas from looking at people from other types of institutions with other backgrounds, with other experience. So if we begin to think about how we do this, um, you know, you may be able to get to a, a you know, a much more um, broader thinking, interesting, um, I don't know, productive, innovative. I'd love to see uh, the schools really develop into this. And I have to congratulate Wisconsin. I've looked at departments and in terms of gender diversity, every department I looked at had made a lot of progress. So that's great. Um, we need to find a mentoring network for career ladders. We need to get to the point where um, ending up as faculty is not the highest point for anybody with a PhD. Uh, you know, it's, it's very important that, that everything be open, every single possibility be open to young people. They need to believe that, that anything is possible for them within a university system or in a company. And again, communication is the hardest problem, you know, uh, for out group people, figuring out how to talk to people in the in group about this because in group people don't see the problem. And so it's, you know, really anything we can do to begin to open up the conversation about this is extremely important. So I want to finish by, I hope I'm not over time. I think, I think this started with Judy, counting with Judy, but this is the part that's really important, I think, for me, and it's about inclusion. And it's when groups are, are neutral, right? So, so skip the other, uh, you know, so we're past the other stuff and we're moving from diversity to inclusion. And it's really about relationships, okay? So, so again, you have in your department and people aren't feeling one way or the other, you don't have clicks, everybody, you know. So how do you get to a point where you're really making um, more productive uh, use of, of being together in a building, for example? Um, and that is in terms of building relationships, um, increasing the, I would talk about increasing the weak interactions. I was telling um, Tom Record that, you know, when you're all like in your, with your in-group, I mean, you're, if everything's perfectly, you're in your, you've got all your weak interactions that are perfect. And, and again, remember the equilibrium constant for associating your in-group is really high. So the only way that you're going to start increasing the stability of B or increase, increasing self-assembly of B is by opening up and kind of having some new binding sites there. Having, you know, opening up. <laughs> and so, you do it by listening and sharing. It takes time. This is not a three hour workshop. This is not, no, this is over time. You are gonna take time. Everybody have tea or coffee or cookies or something and begin to talk about things that are really important to you. And the other stuff will all come out and the ideas and, and but it's, it's, it's actually relationship. And so in my program, what I did was we, we had a set of principles that we talked about and I think you could use anything but my principles were know your heart, look for the positive or blessing in everything. Um, and, and that was like, if someone is really mean to you, you have two immediate positives. I mean, one is that you are not that person. And the second is you're not married to that person. And the kids would laugh and we'd go, well, you see that shows that you don't have to immediately engage with somebody. You can take a moment and you know, decide what you want to do. And it goes on and on. There's, there's tons of depth that you can get into with these principles. Embrace who you are, bring it to the table. That is that we have all the DNA from all our relatives in our bodies and we own all that history and we can bring that to the table and then show gratitude. But you can start with what are you worried about? What's bothering you? Just, you know, but it is relationship. What are your priorities? What are your values? Um, all those things are very important. So finally, I would just say that inclusion is a transition from diversity to relationship. It's, it's be self-assembly. It's how you share your survival tools and your rules, you know, who you go to when you need to get some advice for something. You develop a common language and, and oftentimes principles. And, and I like to connect the disciplines in this so that my students who were often from many different cultures would understand that they and their traditions and how they saw the world had an absolute right to be in science. In fact, it was important that they were there in science. And even I would tell them, even if nobody tells you this ever again, 
I will tell you that you it's important that you're here. Um, and the important part of this is also for everyone to grow their imagination. It's a safe, it's a pretty safe place for all of us to be. And not only that, it's an exciting place to be. So in conclusion, I hope that I, you can see this now uh, a little bit with new eyes, that you remember that the laws of physics scale. Use that, that's really cool. You know, um, use everything you can to imagine and reframe. And, and don't accept the idea that problems can't be solved. I just think that is such a bad way of looking. I mean, even NP hard problems in computer sciences, now people are finding solutions. So pay attention, you know, bias just isn't one thing. It, watch out for confounding factors, especially in hiring and watch out for really super stable in groups um, and ask for accountability at all levels. You know, if someone's asking you to make changes, you know, you say, well, that's fine. I'm happy to do it. And, and you're going to do it too, right? <laughs> I'd love to see this. Um, and real change in ourselves and in groups, it comes from, uh, really, I'm, my belief is that it comes from positive forces. It comes from us wanting to change, us wanting to open up, because we know that um, if we figure out ways to really relate as, as human beings and have a relationship with another person, that we actually are going to benefit in terms of our ideas and our discoveries. And finally, the key to inclusion is relationship. Um, I, I can't, I, I can't uh, say that any stronger. And I think, uh, you know, I'm happy to help if anybody wants to talk about this later. Now, this is for the students. So um, I can't see who's out there, but I just want to say, look, students, you know, we have a long way to go and the path is not clear. We're going to need family and allies. So make sure that you keep track of all your team, stay in touch with them, you know, support them, get their support, and don't give up hope. Close your eyes. Remember who you are and where you come from. Keep in touch with that. You know, your heart really does know the way, and it's distinctly possible that none of us will be able to see it without you, okay? So I'm just, you are so important. Um, if you run into any problems, you know, make sure that you have some team members to go to. So I want to thank you very much. Uh, gracias and Naitra is uh, Karis uh, for thank you, for women to say thank you. And I want to say that, you know, I couldn't have made it without SACNAS. I didn't know until um, the end of my first year at UNM that there were other uh, Mexican Americans and Hispanics and Blacks who were faculty members. It's incredible, but it's been a wonderful thing. And these are a bunch of students and uh, everybody has a great job and all but one has a PhD. So uh, we're doing good. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I'm sure everybody's joining me in. Uh, thanking you so much for your talk, Maggie. Uh, I just put a message in the chat. Um, please feel free to raise your hand um, and ask questions. We're getting lots of hand clapping. Um, and if nobody is going to start, I will certainly start with a question because um, I'm always filled with them. But I would like to open it to anybody, especially trainees who are curious to hear from Maggie. All right. Um, so you kind of listed uh, at the end, you talked a lot about relationships and starting to make real change. Um, I guess I'm curious when you start a project after the initial surveying, when you identify the in groups, the out groups, and how communication strategies work, what are the first actions you typically take when you're trying to start or start to answer problems? Oh, okay. Um, I close my eyes and I just try to sink into it. Um, and, and, uh, you know, I, I try to bring all my uh, experiences to bear, you know, so I would say that time at the NIH meeting, that was pretty impressive when the guy just said, I don't know what you're talking about to me about, he was a chair of a big department and there was another guy who was a surgeon and, uh, you know, don't talk to me about this. I don't do this. And, and everybody stopped. I mean, you know, there were lots of people there in that room. Um, and, and that was an important uh, uh, time to realize that 
uh, it wasn't that he was being mean. Uh, that was really how he saw the world. And so it was like, how do you talk to, how do you begin to talk to somebody like that? And what, oh, geez, when I, when I was looking at baseball and I was realizing that, uh, and, and basketball, I was realizing the players were upset about um, not having managers that reflected the, the players. Uh, and then I started looking at, at uh, you know, departments and stuff. And then I started looking at uh, management of nonprofits, and I started looking at uh, you know all, all sorts of places, and you could just find all these all these uh, white bean groups, you know. And, and it was like, really, these are all the guys that are telling us that we have to diversify. So what's the deal here, you know? And I I just I'm so fascinated now. I want to know if they just think that they don't. I, I don't I don't know what they think. It's I'm really fascinated to to begin to start meeting and talking to people in those groups to try to understand. Um, why they why they haven't felt um, the need to uh, go do something and often the branch Ricky actually examples a good one for them because it'll help them think that they, you know see how they can begin to um, to do something it, it's fascinating I just think they haven't thought about maybe they haven't thought about it I mean it's really interesting to find that kind of a non-random distribution in society so I got um, a message from somebody <laughs> who would like to be anonymous, but um, yeah, it is somebody asking. So they said, on your journey, uh, have you ever had moments where it doesn't seem like you're being heard or that uh, you struggle <laughs> to get your message across? All the time, all the time. So, so let me just say in science, right? You're at the University of New Mexico. You call up Corning because you find there are um, uh, Psi 3 overlapping floors on the slide, on the spot, on, only on spots prior to hybridization. Everybody's doing microarrays, right? And, and Corning tells you, well, it's just because you're in New Mexico, you probably hybridize the slides and didn't know it. And I well, I'm working with a guy at Sandia and we've developed a hyperspectral imaging microarray scanner with multivariate curve resolution. And we can show you how much is in there before. So they ended up listening to us. However, they shut down the whole part of the company. We had done all the solutions for them to fix this whole thing. They shut it down completely. So that was just in the science realm. Oh yeah, so, so this will be familiar to maybe some people here. A few years ago, there were some people that had, this, had written a paper about, we were producing too many PhDs in, in science. And, and these guys were from very, the prestigious universities. And I think they were just used to their students all getting faculty jobs. For some reason they felt it was getting harder for them or something. And I, I tried to explain to them that, that they, these were biochemists and they, they clearly hadn't written all the equations. They didn't realize all the inputs and outputs of PhDs and, and they, so, you know, all PhDs are not going to go to faculty positions. There are lots of companies. There's such exciting things out there for people to do. And by, by them saying we're producing too many PhDs, gave a message to minorities because they're the first ones to respond to this kind of a thing um, that they shouldn't go get a PhD. And I knew it was going to make my work harder and I couldn't get that out. Um, yeah. And even now I'm, you know, sometimes I get on a committee and, um, you know, there's an in-group or something like that, and you just can't get your voice heard. But I think what we, what I, my goal in that then is to, is to, if it's important for me to get my, to get my voice out, is to really try to think of the best, what, what are the priorities of that group or those people that are, that are in that situation? You know, how can I reach them? And I know there's a lot of people that would just go, I'm not going to deal with those guys, but I, I'm, I'm always trying because I think change, real change happens sort of gradually, I think. And um, I'm always trying to figure out ways to just uh, logically reason with people. But I think that, um, you know, uh, I, have, I have students who I, I've gotten to be very close with and they say it's because I saw them because they felt seen when I was around them. And it's like, I don't, I, I don't, I didn't do anything special, but I think that you often don't feel uh, seen or observed. One time on that advisory council, for example, 
um, it just, it, there was no diversity really to, uh, at all because a black guy after that one meeting didn't come back for three years. So um, we had three women on the committee and, and 19 guys. And, and it had never been quite like that. The guys forgot our names. Um, they would uh, um, attribute something that any one of us had said to some guy who said, and these were <laughs> an age advisory council. So it can happen anywhere that your voice isn't heard. And we just have to help each other um, get our voices out because a lot of really important things are never heard. Can I ask a quick question? I, ha I have to leave in three minutes, but I have a quick one for you, Maggie. Sure. Um, so you talked about, you know, faculty hiring committees and many of us faculty have served on those, but there's a broader issue with hiring in general. And I wonder if you, and, and that issue is biased towards, as you nicely highlighted, we have to evaluate candidates based on their past work in other labs yeah. usually we have not seen or we don't know the candidate directly we have not we can't evaluate them on their own independent merits certainly for faculty most faculty positions right so it's it's it is very hard to resist the bias because we don't i, I think it's hard to know what else to look at that's Do right. you have suggestions or strategies aside of prioritizing diversity, which many of our faculty no. you know, searches do? Are there other concrete things you advise that faculty committees or of any hiring committee look at to evaluate independently? Well, I, I've thought about this, and you know, actually, I I think you it's not just diversity. I mean, we can have people with all different you know, color skins in different places and not have a really innovative group. I mean, so what you want, what you want to do, I think, is find out about backgrounds. One is like, how did the person get there? You know, sometimes I've seen people just kind of, they start at the top of the mountain and roll over and roll over. <laughs> and, you know, they've never really fought to get where they are. And so that's one thing is, you know, what was your path to getting to this point? But I, I like the concept, you know, I would imagine that if I were chair of a department, I would like the, me personally, I would like the most creative people to come. And so some of the questions I would ask would be, you know, uh, you know, about their research and what they wanna do in the future. But I would say, what if you run into this challenge? What if you ran into this challenge? You know, um, uh, Randy Diamond, I think was a, was a professor in microbiology when I, when I was here and he was teaching a class and it was, you know, I, I followed a lot of what he did, which was uh, you just make up, you make up paths, you know, and, and, uh, and figure that out. But I think the concept that you can decide who's going to make a great faculty member by looking at a, a CV is, is really uh, sort of, it seems like got to be past its time. And it's not just for, you want diversity, but you want diversity of ideas. You want diversity, you know, what are the, you know, how are they in terms of collaboration? You know, where do they see themselves? I don't know that you have to think in your department. Um, uh, and, and a lot of times we choose for comfort. I mean, I've been in a lot of faculty hires where, where oh, I feel comfortable with this choice, you know, and, and that's when you got to be kind of like, well, let's think about it. Did they really ask enough kind of out of the box questions to, to figure this out. You know, I, I think it's something that, that there's a lot of smart people here. And I think that it would be really cool to, to get an idea from all of the faculty. You know, if you had to ask something outside of the regular questions that you might ask somebody to, for an application, you know, um, not just a research statement and a, and a, you know, statement about teaching, but, you know, how would you include creativity in how you're teaching your class or how would, you know, that kind of stuff to really get, um, uh, you know, what would, I don't know. What, so, you know, one of the people that I went to grad school here with was Robin Kimmerer and she wrote uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. And, and she and I, I didn't talk to her about being Hispanic. She never talked to me about being Native American. We were all by ourselves really, but um, she's done a great job of integrating uh, traditional knowledge with, um, with Western science. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I keep thinking maybe, maybe there's something, uh, if I go back to that book, that there might be something I could think about. But um, I would just say, you know, what is it that we can, you know, what is it that makes a great faculty member 
a great professor, a, a great mentor, you know. I mean, when I hire somebody, if I if um, if they say they treat everybody the same, I would never hire that person, you know, because you can't, you, you can't, you have to know, you know, where they're, where they grew up, are they urban rural, do they come from this reservation or that reservation, are they from a little Hispanic town or from the city, you know, all those guys, you know, you're going to you talk to them, you work with them a little differently to get them to, you know, lift it up. Thanks so much, Maggie. It's always great to see you. <laughs> Good to see you, Audrey. <laughs> All right. Well, I would love for a trainee to ask a question openly, but um, if nobody is going to take me up on that. You can put um, it in the chat. You can put it in the chat. I feel bad that there weren't questions. I mean, did people... Uh, I think the fact that there's still 70 people around, even as you're answering <laughs> questions, means that probably people were engaged. Um, well, I, there, I I, I was afraid the thermodynamics might, yeah, they're leaving now. Um, I was, oh, afraid, okay. no, <laughs> I was afraid that the thermodynamics might throw people off, but I, I thought that, you know, there, there are all these things that we all need to think about. You know, we're all human beings in this boat. Everybody has their, their pluses and their minuses. And I will say, you know, one thing that's fascinating for me helping now uh, PhDs go off and connect with companies is that the longer you're in academia, the less you seem to be paying attention to the skills that you have. Um, I was just saying that, you know, if, if I ask a bachelor's level person and, uh, you know, how they code in Python and they'll go, I'm really great, I'm a five, I've had a half a semester. And you ask a PhD and they'll go, uh, I'm probably a three, I've only used it for five years. Um, you know, <laughs> so we kind of lose perspective as, as faculty sometimes and, and, uh, and PhDs lose perspective on, what we're capable of, but I think we could come up with some really amazing ways to address this. And I mean, I think we start with uh, asking administrations if they notice that they're not diverse. I mean, you know, I'm you go through so many colleges, and the only darker face you see is the diversity officer. I would hate to be in that position. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we have one question from Lainey von Beck. It looks like. Yeah, um, really great talk. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, Thank you. I was just kind of curious because I know you mentioned how you know initially you hadn't even realized um, with Robin Kimmerer, I think you said. Yeah. Who were like were kind of in um, you know the backgrounds of people, and I'm just curious to get your thoughts on how with like social media and stuff now it can be a lot easier to connect and like see these connections and how maybe. You, if there's any way that you know social media and just being able to see who's out there more could help build diversity and inclusion. You know, social media for some reason it's very interesting to me that you can't solve disagreements on social media. You know, you, and and so I think it's hard to have those realistic discussions on social media. Um, you know, I, I'm better at it with Zoom and and in person. Um, but I do think one of the things that, that you could have is uh, a tea, we used to have tea breaks and uh, the Metzenberg's lab used to have um, cookie day, cookie hour or something. And uh, you know, you could go in there and then just make a commitment. We're going to learn everybody. We're gonna learn people's stories, right? So like, I mean, I spent one year, I, two years ago, I just decided I was gonna learn everybody's story. And so I went to, um, Shirley Malcolm, who's at AAAS. And so I was at a meeting with her and I said, well, Shirley, tell me about how you grew up. And she goes, well, I grew up in Birmingham. And the first thing I remember was the bombing of a church, you know, and, and that was kind of what drove her to be a professional and be a scientist and stuff. So I think, you know, it'd be fun to go around and just, um, you know, ask your faculty a little bit about their themselves, but hopefully they'll ask you about you. And once you get kind of, you know, have more of a relationship, you know, all sorts of discoveries possible in terms of, you know, thinking about ideas and, and, uh, and, and just, just being able to help each other when, when it's needed. Judith, do you have a question? 
Well, no, my, my question is I'm supposed to be talking to you next and I wanted to make sure that you wanted to go immediately from your seminar to you know, a one-on-one -on -one with me. And so uh, do you like a couple minutes downtime? <laughs> I, here's the deal. So I'm retired, right? And I was home and, and I thought yesterday was my virtual travel day, but it wasn't. I had like meetings in the morning. It was so great. And then I met with people all day today. Well, my, my internet went down three times. So I haven't been in this department because I'm retired. I haven't been in the department for um, a year and a half, over almost two years. And I, I, so I, we just rushed to the department, brought my big old second monitor and uh, I'm set up thing. And so, you know, talking right now is fine. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm not in anybody's office that I know. So I, I think it's a different <laughs> Zoom link that I'm supposed to log into. So okay. I'll log into that, but. All right. All right. Yeah. Listen, if anybody has any questions, my email, you can find me. I'm all over the web. You know, I've had a very uh, diverse, interesting career. And um, I'm sorry I didn't talk about science. I worked on yeast, uh, quiescent, non quiescent cells in stationary phase. I love it. Um, but, but I really thought that, um, you know, this might be something that you would be able to chew on a little bit more. So um, I hope that everybody liked it. But you're free to contact me and uh, ask questions or just tell me anything tell me your, especially tell me your responses because uh you know i was very nervous coming back to the biochemistry department uh, you guys are are big in my heart and uh, bob burris and mo cleland and all these guys were huge in my life and even james crow and i mean just wisconsin's an incredible place <laughs> and betty and and uh, ken keekster and everybody <laughs> and thank you judy for inviting me no, thank you so much for coming and speaking with our group and with our students. And it's been such a pleasure to host you. So I'm going to end the Zoom meeting, but uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Judith, I'll see you next time. Yeah. Okay. okay.